Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things, and welcome to another video in my really long series of Bleak House by Charles Dickens. So I'm doing a Victorian style serialised read long of Bleak House that we are currently coming up to about halfway through the book and this video is on the chapters that we read in the month of November so I am a little behind as always but the four chapters that we read in the month of November were chapter 26 sharpshooters, chapter 27 more old soldiers than one, chapter 28 the iron master and chapter 29 the young man. Quite an exciting bunch of chapters this month lots of grand plot revelations. As usual I will go quickly through the plot of each chapter and then talk about points of interest. So chapter 26 sharpshooters lots of points of interest in here. We start off in Mr George's shooting gallery with a scene between Mr George and Phil in which Phil watches Mr George um, wash in rather a homoerotic way but anyway we'll talk about that in a minute. Then Mr George and Phil are visited by Mr Smallweed who comes along with his granddaughter to say that he is in search of a sample of Captain Horden's handwriting and then he wants to share this sample of Captain Horden's handwriting with a lawyer that he knows which leads us on into the next chapter so quite brief in terms of what happens in this chapter but let's discuss the points of interest because there is a lot to talk about in this chapter. I've mentioned already in this Bleak House read long that I think there is decent ground to read Mr George and Phil's relationship as in some way homoerotic. This interpretation comes to a large extent from a book called Queer Dickens by Holly Fernu which is a really really brilliant interesting look at Dickens's work and I personally think there is a lot of like tension between Mr George and Phil squad um, and that their attachment to each other is if not like presented in a sexual way is presented to a certain extent in quite a romantic way which I think is really really interesting to look at. Certainly they are like a domestic unit and although Phil is the servant of Mr George they have a relationship of equality and although Phil calls Mr George governor Mr George calls Phil comrade making them like equal in that sense um, which I quite like. So this chapter begins firstly with a beautiful description of the kind of wintry morning in Leicester Square which I really really love it's just I love Dickens's writing so much wintry morning looking with dull eyes and sallow faces upon the neighbourhood of Leicester Square finds its inhabitants unwilling to get out of bed many of them are not early risers at the brightest of times being birds of the night who roost when the sun is high and are wide awake and keen for prey when the stars shine out behind dingy blind and curtain in upper story and garret skulking more or less under false names false hair false titles false jewelry and false histories a colony of brigades lie in their first sleep etc etc it's so lovely and then we have the moment when mr george and phil wake up the wintry morning wakes mr george of the shooting gallery and his familiar phil they arise roll up and stir away their mattresses mr george having shaved himself before a looking glass of minute proportions then marches out bareheaded and bare chested to the pump in the little yard and anon comes back shining with yellow soap friction drifting rain and exceedingly cold water as he rubs himself upon a large jack towel blowing like a military sort of diver just come up his crisp hair curling tighter and tighter on his sunburnt temples the more he rubs it so that it looks as if it could never be loosened by any less coercive instrument than an iron rake or a curry comb. As he rubs and puffs and polishes and blows, turning his head from side to side, the more conveniently to exonerate his throat, and standing with his body well bent forward to keep the wet from his martial legs, Phil on his knees, lighting a fire, looks round as if it were enough washing to see all that done, and sufficient renovation for one day to take in the superfluous health his master throws off. So we have this scene of like Phil sat at the fire watching George wash and they have this sort of little morning routine and then we learn a little bit more about how Phil and George came to know each other and how Mr George came upon Phil in the street and effectively helped him out of the predicament he was in. What accident have you met with? You have been badly hurt. What's amiss old boy? Cheer up and tell us about it. Cheer up. I was cheered already. I says as much to you. You says more to me. I says more to you. You says more to me. And here I am, Commander. Here I am. If a mark's wanted or if it will improve the business, let the customers take aim at me. They can't spoil my beauty. I'm all right. Come on. If they want a man to box that, let him box me. Let him knock me well about the head. I don't mind. If they want a lightweight to be thrown for practice, let them throw me. They won't hurt me. I have been thrown all sorts of styles in my life. Like, I find Phil a really interesting character because he's someone who has had quite a difficult life. He's had a fairly difficult life to begin with and then had an accident while working in a firework factory which means he now walks with difficulty but effectively he says that 
George's presence kind of cheers him and that his life with George has been so much better than it was before. And I like the way they express affection for each other as well. Phil Squad shoulders his way round three sides of the gallery and abruptly tacking off at his commander makes a butt at him with his head intended to express devotion to his service. I find them quite sweet and I find their relationship fairly romantic whether you want to consider it like actually romantic or a kind of romance as it's called then you know that's up to you. And I find it interesting as well Phil Squad as a character and how other different characters perceive him because when you see him talking to George he's like really nice and quite sweet but obviously Mr Smallweed when he turns up is quite afraid of Phil Squad partly because Mr Smallweed knows he's not really George's friend and that George just knows this and that Phil Squad is devoted to George and would probably knock anybody out of the way that George wanted out of the way. Mr Smallweed gets very frantic when he turns up about the fact that Phil Squad is like mending guns and then <laughs> like stand back sharpening knives as Mr Smallweed watches on which he does not like. Before I go on to talk more about Mr Smallweed I just want to say how much I really like Mr George as a character. I love that when Mr Smallweed is trying to starting hinting at my he, why he might be there Mr George says if you want to convert of me must speak out. I'm one of the roughs and I can't go about and about. I haven't the art to do it. I'm not clever enough. It don't suit me. And we learn towards the end of the chapter that Mrs. Smallweed has come here in search of a sample of writing that Mr. George might have of Captain Horden's. He says that he still believes Captain Horden is not dead, which George simply does not believe. Mr. George has some reservations about giving Mrs. Smallweed and his granddaughter Judy a sample of Captain Horden's writing. Mr Smallweed and Judy keep close eyes on Mr George and they think they have a suspicion of where Mr George might have kept such a sample of handwriting and then at the end of the chapter they take a carriage off to see Mr Tulkinghorn. So chapter 27, more old soldiers than one. In chapter 27 Mr George and Mr Smallweed go to see Mr Tulkinghorn who says that he would like a sample of Captain Horden's handwriting. Mr George is very suspicious about this, says he suspects that he does not want to part with any sample of handwriting because he doesn't know why they want it and he suspects it is not for good purposes. He says, can he have some time to think about it and goes off to consult some friends of his, Mr. Bagnet and his wife. I love the Bagnets. I had forgotten about the Bagnets. It's been a little while since I last read Bleak House. Um, and then in the middle of this chapter, when the Bagnets appear, I was like, ah, oh, the Bagnets! And it filled me with such excitement because I find them quite a fun, interesting couple. Mr. George consults Mr. Bagnet about his opinion on whether or not he should part with a sample of handwriting. Mr. Bagnet tells his wife to tell Mr. George his opinion because Mr. Bagnet actually just, just, agrees with everything his wife says um, and his wife is really the brains of their marriage but he likes to pretend that he is so he says Mrs Bagnet give George my opinion upon which Mrs Bagnet gives her opinion which Mr Bagnet says is his and the opinion of Mrs Bagnet and also of Mr Bagnet is that he ought not to part with a sample of the handwriting. Mr George agrees and he goes off to see Mr Tolkienhorn to tell him this and Mr Tolkienhorn is quite suspicious about finding George back at his house, especially because he says he has since learnt, since meeting him earlier that day, that Mr George knew Mr Gridley, who died a few chapters ago and who Mr Tolkienhorn considered a very dangerous man. So, points of interest in this chapter. I want to talk a little bit about the characterisation of Mr Tolkienhorn because he is such an interesting character. He is in many ways, I think, I think there is a little bit of Scrooge in Mr. Tolkienhorn because there is the suggestion that he has a lot of money but that he doesn't spend it. Mr. Smallweed says that Mr. Tolkienhorn is worth a mint of money and powerfully rich but he certainly doesn't seem to live a very glamorous lifestyle. Indeed he is rustily dressed with his spectacles in his hand and they're very case-worn threadbare. Despite the fact he has all this money he lives this kind of threadbare old-fashioned existence. And then I also love the fact that every time Dickens describes Mr. Tolkienhorn, although Dickens is a writer who in his third person narration in general slips in and out of characters heads. He's never fully committed to Mr Tulkinghorn's head. As Mr Tulkinghorn takes off his gloves and puts them in his hat he looks with half closed eyes across the room to where the trooper stands and says within himself perchance you'll do my friend. Whenever we kind of hear Mr Tulkinghorn's thoughts there's always a qualifier, there's always a perhaps or perchance the idea that not even Dickens can fully know Mr Tulkinghorn because he's that much of a man of mystery. And of course when Mr Tulkinghorn says that he wants to compare Captain Horden's writing to a affidavit he has for Jarndyce and Jarndyce I I think we do begin, at least I hope you do, but it doesn't matter because you find out in a few chapters anyway, begin to suspect that that John Dyson John Dice affidavit is probably the only other significant John Dyson John Dice affidavit we have encountered in this book, which was the one which very, very early on in the novel made Lady Deadlock faint. 
so lots of drama here. I also want to talk a little bit about Mr Smallweed and Judy in this chapter. Really interesting that Judy is present in this chapter and the last and I don't think she says a single word. She's kind of constantly present just watching but never really saying anything. Mr Smallweed is a very interesting character. We have seen how two-faced he is, what a hypocrite he is, and how he pretends friendship to George's face. But the moment George is out the room, he, not to give it up, he, a vagabond, but never mind, sir, never mind. At most he has only his own way for a little while. I have him periodically in a vice. I'll twist him, sir, I'll screw him, sir. If he won't do it with good grace, I'll make him do it with a bad one. And now let's talk about the Bagnets. I do find the Bagnets a really interesting couple. Now, it's not that common in Dickens that you find a functional nuclear family. I always forget about the Bagnets when I list them. I generally say it's the Cratchits and there's not many others, uh, but the Bagnets are another one as well. And I find the relationship between Mr and Mrs Bagnet quite interesting because they live within this kind of Victorian system, which means that outwardly Mr Bagnet has to pretend to be the one in charge. He says repeatedly discipline must be maintained, but actually we see very clearly that his wife is the one who is kind of in charge and that when Mr George comes to consult Mr Bagnet's opinion, he doesn't give his opinion. He says, old girl, give him my opinion. You know it, tell him what it is. <laughs> he says to George, you know me, it's my old girl that advises. She has the head, but I never owned to it before her. Discipline must be maintained. His idea is that his wife doesn't realise that she is the one who's more in control of the household, whereas I feel like she definitely does. One of those incidences in which you see in Dickens a kind of confirming and reinforcing of Victorian gender dynamics where there is discipline in a household and the husband kind of rules the wife but also it is completely overturned by the fact that that's not actually what's going on here that's just what they pretend and say is going on because that's what they have to do within the Victorian system whereas actually she has the kind of power and the say in things more than he does. I also love the fact that their children are nicknamed by the places in which they were born because they're all born in like different countries which I just think is quite fun. Anyway, I think that's all I wanted to say on this chapter. We do have four chapters to talk about today so I'm trying to go relatively quickly and also these four chapters are quite plot heavy and less like um, social criticism analysis heavy. So Let's move on to chapter 28, The Iron Master. In this chapter we are back at Chesney Wold with Sir Lester and Lady Deadlock and they have many, many cousins visiting them. All of the poor relations of the Deadlocks are currently there. Bulimlia Deadlock, who is a cousin of Celesta Deadlock, comments to Lady Deadlock how she has seen about the place a very pretty maid, Rosa. And shortly after this, Lady Deadlock and Celesta Deadlock re receive a visit from Mr Rouncewell, who is the son of Mrs Rouncewell, their housekeeper. Now, Mr Rouncewell is an iron master and doing rather well for himself. Um, and his son, Watt, we have met previously, and Watt has fallen in love with Rosa. And Mr Rouncewell comes to... Wold to say that he will consent to a marriage or an engagement between Rosa and Watt but he would first like to take Rosa away from Chesney Wold and have her educated for a few years so that she better suits the class that his son belongs to which Celeste Deadlock doesn't take very well at all partly because he thinks that Mr Rouncewell has moved out of his social sphere and disapproves but also because he thinks that for Rosa to be um, in the favour of Lady Deadlock is more than anybody should want. And at the end of the chapter, Lady Deadlock talks to Rosa and asks if, he, if she is in love with what and whether or not she desires to leave her yet. And we see that Lady Deadlock is incredibly fond of Rosa. So, points of interest in this chapter, there is quite a lot to talk about. Firstly, let's talk about Celeste Deadlock and his cousins. I really like Celeste Deadlock. He is a snob, he is proud, he is silly, he is very old fashioned, but he is also kind, um, and I'll talk about this more as the book goes on, why I like him as a character. But I like the fact that while he doesn't really acknowledge his very famous, well-known cousins, he's really nice to his cousins that don't have much money. While he is stately in the cousinship of the everybodies, he is a kind and generous man according to his dignified way in the cousinship of the nobodies. He cares about and looks after all of his relations who have less money than him, partly out of a sense of duty and partly just because he is kind of quite a nice man. Before I talk about the conversation with Mr Rouncewell and about class and how it's looked at in this chapter, I want to talk just a little bit about the relationship between Rosa and Lady Deadlock. When Volumnia asks if she is Lady Deadlock's maid, Lady Deadlock says no, not anything, pet, secretary, messenger, I don't know what. And then Volumnia says, you'd like to have her about you as you would like to have a flower or a bird or a pitcher or a poodle, no not a poodle though, or anything else that is equally pretty. Yes, how charming. And yet I don't think that's quite right. I don't think Lady Deadlock just wants Rosa there because she's pretty and she likes pretty things. I think from the very end of this chapter you get a very different impression and you can really see the strength of her attachment to Rosa, that she is truly fond of her and that she doesn't think of her as 
as as a sort of pretty decoration as an ornament she thinks of her as a person who she cares about and we see a kind of tender affectionate lady deadlock that we have not witnessed before is this lady deadlock standing beside the village beauty smoothing her dark hair with that motherly touch and watching her with eyes so full of musing interests i indeed it is and from what we learn in the next chapter i think it's fair to say that lady deadlock kind of takes on Rosa as a sort of surrogate child who she in some way aims to look after and to care for in the absence of her own child, which I find really, really interesting. And I think also you see that kind of conflict in Lady Deadlock between wanting Rosa to be happy and to marry Mr. Rouncewell's son if that's what will make her happy, but also she really doesn't want to lose her because she is very fond of her. But now let's talk about the actual conversation with Mr. Rouncewell, which takes up a bulk of this chapter because I find it really, really interesting. Prior to this conversation, we do learn a little bit about Mr. Rouncewell from what's lesser deadlock says to Volumnia. It is a remarkable example of the confusion into which the present age has fallen, of the obliteration of landmarks, the opening of floodgates and the uprooting of distinctions, that I have been informed by Mr Tolkienhorn that Mrs Rouncewell's son has been invited to go into Parliament. He is called, I believe, an Iron Master. I mentioned that I like Celeste Deadlock, but he is very old fashioned and very pompous. And the idea of a self made man is quite kind of disgusting to Celeste. He really finds it very difficult to understand and to accept the fact that his housekeeper's son was invited to join Parliament, because for him that is just like such a disruption of the social order, which is so interesting to look at in terms of Victorian class and how it operates. He reminds me quite a lot in many ways of My Lady Ludlow from My Lady Ludlow by Elizabeth Gaskell and Lady Lufton from Anthony Trollope's family parsonage where they have very sort of old-fashioned viewpoints especially with regards to class but you still kind of sympathize with them as a character because they are so well drawn and it's interesting to see the way that Mr Rouncewell is clearly very proud of the position he has and also of where he's come from he is proud of being a self-made man and I find his speeches to Celeste Dedlock and Celeste Dedlock's reaction to them really really interesting I am the son of your housekeeper Lady Dedlock and passed my childhood about this house my mother has lived here half a century and will die here I have no doubt she's one of those examples perhaps as good a one as there is of love and attachment and fidelity in such a station which England may well be proud of but of which no order can appropriate the whole pride or whole merit because such an instance bespeaks high worth on two sides on the great side assuredly on the small one no less assuredly pardon me for saying what is so obvious but i wouldn't have it hastily suppose that i am ashamed of my mother's position here or wanting in all just respect for chesney wold and the family i certainly may have desired i certainly have desired lady deadlock that my mother should retire after so many years and end her days with me but as i have found that to sever this strong bond will be to break her heart i have long abandoned this idea I have been an apprentice and a workman. I have lived on workman's wages years and years and beyond a certain point have had to educate myself. My wife was a foreman's daughter and plainly brought up. We have three daughters beside the son of whom I have spoken and being fortunately able to give them greater advantages than we have had ourselves, we have educated them well, very well. It has been one of our great cares and pleasures to make them worthy of any station. All this is so frequent, Lady Deadlock, where I live and among the class to which I belong, that what would generally be called unequal marriages are not of such rare occurrences with us as elsewhere. A son will sometimes make it known to his father that he has fallen in love, say, with a young woman in the factory. The father who once worked in the factory himself will be a little disappointed at first, very possibly. However, the chances are that having ascertained the young woman to be of unblemished character, he will say to his son, I must be quite sure that you are in earnest here. This is a serious matter for both of you. Therefore, I shall have this girl educated for two years or it may be I shall have this girl at the same school with your sisters for such a time during which you will give me your word and honour to see her only so often. And this is the proposition that he makes, that he will take Rosa away to have her educated. Um, and he makes it in this way, which makes Celeste say, Mr. Rouncewell, do you draw a parallel between Chesney Wold and a factory? Which just makes me laugh. He is so appalled at the idea. For Celeste, the fact that Rosa is honoured with Lady Deadlock's favour is the greatest possible advantage in the world. And Rosa being a servant, he considers a perfect match for a servant's grandson. The problem being, of course, that Mrs. Rouncewell's son, Mr. Rouncewell, has risen much higher than his mother in station and in life. That chapter and Mr. Rouncewell as a character is so interesting in terms of class. So moving on to the final chapter of this month, chapter 29, The Young Man. In this chapter, Celeste and Lady Deadlock go back to London, where Lady Deadlock receives a visit from a certain young man by the name of Mr. Guppy, who seems to have made some rather complicated discoveries regarding Lady Deadlock in his efforts to help Esther Summerson and to try and 
find out something about her past that may help her look more favourably upon his proposals, he has found a connection between Lady Dedlock and Esther. And we learn several things in this chapter which link several different plot lines of this book together. We learn that Esther Summerson's real name is Esther Horden. And of course we have heard of a Horden before. We have heard of Captain Horden, who is Mr George's friend. We also learn that the law writer, Mr Nemo, who died at the beginning of the book, was Captain Horden. That man was Esther's father. We also learn that Lady Dedlock is Esther's mother, and that Lady Dedlock's sister, Miss Barbary, took Esther away from her as a child because Esther was born out of wedlock, raised Esther in secret, and told Lady Dedlock that her child had died. Lady Dedlock has gone on living her life in the constant depression she has been in since this, believing that her child died. She learns in this chapter that her child lived and that her child is Esther Summerson, who she has met. So much drama! Also, before I go on to talking about the points of interest in this chapter, I think it's very interesting that this comes out so early. And um, Dickens is quite interesting for having like midway point reveals. There's a similar kind of midway point reveal in Our Mutual Friend, because so many of his books operate around mysteries. But this big mystery of Esther's parentage is resolved and found out at this point halfway through the book, which is really, really interesting in terms of the kind of pace and structure of the book. So, the conversation between Mr Guppy and Lady Dedlock. It's here that we finally learn the clue to why Mr Guppy was so taken by that portrait of Lady Dedlock. It is because he recognised the similarity between Esther and Lady Dedlock, perhaps also why Esther is slightly taken aback with and Fi fixated with Lady Dedlock, partly because there's a bit of her that just feels connected to her in some way, and also because perhaps she also in some way unconsciously recognises the similarities um, in appearance between her and Lady Dedlock. It's also worth noting, now that we know that Esther's parents are Captain Horden uh, slash Mr Nemo and Lady Dedlock, that Mr George earlier on recognised Esther, and of course he was a dear good friend of Captain Horden, so may have recognised bits of Captain Horden in her, or if he has ever laid eyes on Lady Dedlock, who is a kind of well-known figure, that may also be where he recognised Esther from. I think it's interesting to look at Mr Guppy as a character in this and as a person, because his motivations for doing this are entirely for Esther, effectively, and in order to try and win Esther in some way. When Lady Dedlock tries to offer him money, he says that that is not what motivates him. He doesn't want any money. He will bring the letters to her quite for free. Mr Guppy can get hold of letters, presumably found in Mr Nemo's lodgings in Mr Crook's shop, presumably correspondence between Captain Horden and Lady Dedlock, that he can bring to Lady Dedlock, and he is willing to do this free of charge in order to effectively save her scandal. What he wants to do is try and help Esther in some way, learn more about her, and also to try and show that Esther has a link to Jarndyce and Jarndyce, and that she too could be a party in the suit if it ever gets resolved, because of course she is Lady Dedlock's daughter, and Lady Dedlock is involved in Jarndyce and Jarndyce, which means in some way surely Esther must be related to Ada and Richard and also Mr Jarndyce, because Lady Dedlock is a distant relation connection to them as well. I mentioned in a previous video that Miss Flight calls Esther Fitz Jarndyce, um, and that Fitz was sometimes used in a surname to denote illegitimacy, which I said at the time is very interesting because Esther is like half illegitimate, but also Esther's like half involved with Jarndyce by living with that family, but also isn't. But of course, it's very interesting that Esther is actually illegitimately part of the Jarndyce family in some way because Lady Dedlock is involved in that case and must be therefore distantly related to the Jarndyces too. Very interesting stuff here, isn't it? There's so much I could now can talk about which I couldn't talk about before. Anyway, Mr Guppy in this chapter, you see his motivation and you also see how nervous he is, how stressed the situation makes him, how he is rather intimidated by Lady Dedlock, perhaps unsurprisingly. And I also find it very interesting here to look at Lady Dedlock's reaction, because of course she is usually a very impassive person, and throughout most of this scene she remains impassive and yet her face slowly changes colour, and the way Dickens like denotes this is really, really interesting. Is the dead colour on my lady's face reflected from the screen which has a green silk ground, or is it a dreadful paleness that has fallen upon her? And then the moment the guppy says that he learnt from Mrs Chadband, who used to be Mrs Rachel, that Esther Summerson's real name was Esther Horden. Lady Dedlock says, my god, it has an exclamation mark, like, Lady Dedlock throughout the rest of this book is not a character who you can imagine having an exclamation mark in her speech. We here get a final confirmation, which surely everybody knew before this point, that Lady Dedlock was the lady dressed in servant's clothes, 
who went to Jo and asked Jo to show her the places where Nemo lived because she has known for a very long time back that Mr Nemo was Captain Horde and her old lover because she recognised the hand her writing of the affidavit way way back at the beginning and that is what made her faint. And then finally we have Lady Deadlock's full reaction at the very end of this chapter. This cry is in the house going upwards from a wild figure on its knees. Oh my child, my child, not dead in the first hours of her life as my cruel sister told me, but sternly nurtured by her after she had renounced me and my name. Oh my child, my child. Oh, it's so dramatic, isn't it? Please tell me down in the comments who guessed it. I can't remember, because I, I saw the television adaptation first. I don't think I guessed in that, but I can't remember if I would have guessed in the book. Um, I'm very interested to know who figured out beforehand or suspected that Lady Deadlock might be Esther's mother and if you did did you also suspect that Captain Horden slash Mr Nemo might be her father because I feel like that's harder to predict so so interesting anyway that is all I wanted to say for today in the month of December we are reading the next few chapters which are chapter 30 Esther's narrative chapter 31 nurse and patient and chapter 32 the appointed time so much drama coming up so thank you very much for watching I hope you're all still continuing to enjoy Bleak House and I'll be back very soon with another bookish video